Hi, my name is Paul Barron and I'm a final year PhD student studying materials for nuclear fusion at the University of Manchester. It's Friday the 14th of August and this is your fusion news update. So today we've got a nice variety of stories from the last two weeks, including 1. Nuclear Fusion Technology Centre to trial exotic alloy parts. 2. Spacecraft of the future could be powered by lattice confinement fusion. 3. Department of Energy announces $21 million for fusion energy instrumentation. And finally, number 4. Nuclear fusion will not save us. 1. Nuclear Fusion Technology Centre to trial exotic alloy parts. First up, we have a story that's happened not too far from me, here up in the north of England. Production Engineering Solutions reports that the external construction of a new fusion research facility in South Yorkshire is complete. This new facility will be focused on developing and testing new materials and components for use in fusion reactors. This will involve using devices that mimic the high heat fluxes and strong magnetic fields that components will experience in a fusion reactor. Damon Johnson, head of the UK Atomic Energy Authority's Yorkshire team said, We can't wait to get going, and have no doubt the hub of manufacturing excellence being created in the area will prove to be of great importance to the commercialisation of fusion power. The construction of this new facility represents a big step towards developing a UK supply chain for the fusion industry. 2. Spacecraft of the future could be powered by lattice confinement fusion. Spectrum magazine published an article about a new method of fusion confinement. Unlike the conventional confinement techniques which utilise huge magnets or lasers to confine the fuel, so-called lattice confinement fusion utilises the crystalline atomic structure of a metal to hold the hydrogen isotopes in place. Now, before you start thinking, this sounds suspiciously like cold fusion. Allow me to explain. The new technique developed at NASA's Glenn Research Centre was detailed in two papers published in Physical Review C. First, the researchers loaded erbium and titanium metal samples of deuterium gas under high pressure, then blasted the samples of high energy photons, which accelerated the deuterons sufficiently to overcome the mutual electrostatic repulsion between the positively charged nuclei so that they fused together, releasing energy. The key to this technique is the screening effect provided by the electrons in the metal lattice that allows the ions to fuse. Lawrence Forsley, senior lead experimental physicist, stressed, What we did was not cold fusion. We've come up with a new way of driving it. This technique holds promise as a future power source for deep space missions where both weight and space are at a premium. 3. The US Department of Energy has announced $21 million in funding for the development of a new diagnostic equipment for fusion reactors. It will support the installation and operation of several new instruments on NSTXU, a spherical tokamak reactor at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory in New Jersey. The new diagnostics will allow scientists at the facility to probe key physics problems as well as validating existing computer models. Although currently offline for repairs, NSTXU is one of the largest fusion devices in the US. Dr Chris Fall, the director of the DOE's Office of Science, said, One of the most important developments in fusion energy research in recent years has been the growing use of sophisticated computer modelling and simulation to better understand the behaviour of plasmas and the operation of fusion reactors. Validating these models in turn requires the development of more sophisticated diagnostic equipment and this initiative will be a major contribution to that effort. Nuclear fusion will not save us. The last article for today is an opinion piece featured in Gizmodo. Although critical of nuclear fusion, the article raises some salient points addressing some of the safety concerns of fusion from a public, non-specialist perspective. While acknowledging that fusion produces no carbon dioxide and offers a lower waste alternative to nuclear fission, the article notes that it will produce some waste and will require mining for raw materials, which could prove destructive to both human health and the environment, and often affecting indigenous or rural communities especially. Author Yesenia Funes said, Intense attention on the climate crisis allows other ecological crises to happen alongside it. No one wants to see the world burn from rising temperatures, but disenfranchised communities don't want to keep being sacrificed for the sake of human progress either. It's important that the fusion community takes note of these concerns. Hopefully the author will be reassured by the fact that research efforts are rightly focused on minimising the waste that nuclear fusion reactors will produce. Furthermore, both private and public fusion ventures are working closely with government regulatory bodies to ensure public safety. And to finish up, some bonus content. I'm sure you're all aware that the Assembly of ITO, the world's largest fusion project, began a few weeks ago. Since then, there have been plenty of articles talking about it, including this one here from Forbes, which also gives a mention to industry association members, Tokamak Energy, TAE Technologies, General Fusion and First Light Fusion. There have also been lots of great pictures showing this assembly process in more detail. 
Here you can see the first vacuum vessel section being moved inside the huge assembly hall where ITER will be built. And that's all for this week. If you'd like to learn more about any of the stories discussed in this video, the links are all in the description. And if you'd like more Fusion News updates, please subscribe. Thanks for tuning in.